Very good. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so this is Wendy Chung again. I'm going to, uh, Dr. Sid and I are going to do a tag team. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about, uh, just a little bit about Hive P2 itself. Um, Lindsay, maybe you could go to the next slide and some of the genetics as well as some of the medical issues. And then Dr. Sid is going to go uh, over a lot of the neurobehavioral um, associated manifestations and in particular some of the questions that you guys have asked. So when we think about Hive P2, um, it's sort of, you might ask yourself, well, why should a change in this gene cause the symptoms that my son or daughter has? Um, and I have to say, we don't entirely know the answer to that. We do know that it's a gene that's involved in, from a developmental point of view, how the brain grows and develops. And it's kind of like a conductor in the sense that it's responsible for regulation of many other genes that are responsible for how the brain grows and develops. And so um, we think to a certain extent, this is a developmental condition. In other words, something that is different as the brain is developing. Um, but it also probably has continued ongoing sort of day-to-day -day functions in terms of how the brain is working specifically. Um, people have wondered in terms of what other uh, parts of the body are important in terms of its function. Um, people have thought about the immune system, how you fight infections, as well as some other parts of the body. Um, but in my opinion, probably the biggest role that it plays is in terms of the brain. And then you'll see that as we start talking through things. Next slide. In terms of the genetics of this, um, everyone who's on this call got here because their child had some sort of genetic testing. And I won't spend too much time on this, but for all of your children, at least to my knowledge, um, there's two copies of the Hive P2 gene. One has a change and one does not have a change. So one is sort of the normal uh, genetic information and one has a difference, genetic difference, which is responsible for the different manifestations. Um, at least to my knowledge, for everyone who's on this call, that genetic change was what we call new or de novo, meaning that it was not inherited or passed down from either the mother or the father, but something that started brand new with the child uh, with some of the neurodevelopmental issues. Um, for the twins in particular, it's very likely that the twins actually started out essentially as one embryo and then split, um, and that that embryo that had it had that uh, genetic change, and then that was carried by both of the twins uh, after the twins separated. Um, so with that, there's, uh, importantly, I just want to say very briefly, there was nothing that either parent did to cause or be able to prevent this from happening. Whenever we have children, we literally have over a hundred such genetic differences that neither the mother or the father has. Um, in some cases, those are changes that don't happen to land in a place that's important, a gene that has a sort of fundamental role in the way the body develops or, or functions. And so those kind of sit silently in the background, but every once in a while these fall in a gene like Hive P2. Um, and actually it's not so rare that it happens to fall in a gene, either Hive P2 or other similar genes. Um, Hive P2 is probably much more common than we appreciate. It's just that not enough people have had access to the genetic testing you all have had access to. And over time, I'm sure we're going to identify more such individuals. Next slide. So as we do this, um, I'm sorry, this is just what I was saying before in terms of when this happened, um, that genetic change, that new genetic change could have been in the egg, could have been in the sperm, could have happened after conception. Um, but generally what we say is for any of you that are thinking of having other children, um, there's a low but non-zero chance that it could happen again. And that, that risk is, we estimate to be about 1% because it's theoretically possible that some other egg cells or some other sperm cells could have the same Hive P2 change. Um, but in general, like I said, it's, it's not something that for most parents I think should stop them or prevent them from having other children if they desire it because in general it's not very likely to happen again. Next slide. Um, I want to go through, and the data I'm going to be sharing with you are all data that came from the Simons VIP study. So thanks for everyone who's been a part of that. Um, if anyone hasn't had the chance to be part of that but needs some help registering, we'll be glad to explain it and help you get, get started on that. Um, as we had the families come in, um, as Nurse was saying at the beginning, it's, it's really exciting to see the community grow. There were 17 families who started the registration process, and then what we always do to be sure that everyone is in the right club is we have you send in a copy of your genetic test report. We review that, make sure that we agree that you belong in the Hive P2 club. Um, almost all the time when you guys get here, in fact, that's the correct club to be in. Um, 
very rarely, I'd say less than 5% of the time, we'll end up with a family that um, really may have something else going on or we don't think it's the answer. And so we do that review. Um, with that, there are some of you, and if you ever looked at your test report carefully enough, it might have said variants of uncertain significance. Um, so that reason that number goes from 16 to 12 is for four of the families out there, um, although Hive P2 is likely the answer, it wasn't 100% certain, and so we wanted to have the cleanest possible data for you to present, the things we could be most confident of. Um, but as time goes on, I'm pretty sure most of those four will go on to be reclassified or considered to be the, the cause um, for those kiddos. Um, of those 12, nine of them went on to complete uh, the information I'm going to give back to you, what we call the medical history interview, and then we did a data freeze right after Thanksgiving to be able to get that all together for everyone. Uh, one of the points I want to make is that the ages of the participants I'm going to share with you today are still, um, to me, relatively young, so ranging between the ages of 2 and 11. Um, that also means that there are many probably older people out there, adults in particular, who are not part of this. Um, and I and others have been trying to figure out how to identify those folks because I think they're going to hold some of our answers for the future. Next slide. So. Um, I know this looks like gobbledygook, um, but these are the different genetic changes in the Hive P2 that we've seen uh, among those 12 families that we passed the um, genetic test report review. I'm not going to worry about going through all of these except to say that the stars, you'll see a bunch of stars on different lines. Um, to me, that means that those proteins, that at least one copy of the Hive P2 protein is not correctly produced. Uh, it gets kind of, instead of making the full length or the total protein, the body starts to make it and then gets stuck at some point um, and doesn't make the full complete protein. Um, the very last row you'll see there is a change that affects a process that is about cutting and pasting bits of the gene together, or what we call splicing, and I think that would have a similar effect. Um, but there is one person, the very first line, that has a different type of change where it's just a substitution for one, what we call amino acid, or one building block of the protein with another. Um, and this is just meant to show you the address of these different changes. On the column on the right, I'm showing you how many individuals have each of the different genetic changes. And the thing that I think is most important to note out of this is almost everyone has a different genetic change. Um, whether or not most of these genetic changes, even though they're different, are acting in the same way, I think is probably the case. In other words, that even though it looks like all of these are different, I think there are probably similarities or convergence is the, the term I like to think about. Um, but in particular, we don't know this for sure. And so as Dr. Sid and I are going to talk about, you'll see that there's some diversity or some difference between different individuals. That could be between because their Hive P2 changes are different. It also could be because they're, some are boys, some are girls, some are young, some are, you know, a little bit older, um, some have, you know, had different things going on around them in terms of what I think of as environmental exposures or triggers for things. There are lots of different reasons, but as we get deeper into the understanding, um, we're going to be trying to sort out these different genetic variants and whether or not they're related to the clinical severity or the clinical symptoms that we see. Next slide. So as we're going through this, uh, again, I'm going to report to you the information that we got from talking to you about the medical history. Next slide. Um, as we go through this, uh, the thing that's most common and consistent across everyone was some sort of neurodevelopmental um, symptoms. Um, so there are some individuals that have delays in their development when they learn to walk and talk and um, sort of the, it's like I think about the books, what to, um, so of different milestones, you know, what to expect in the first year. Um, those, those are different expectations, uh, slightly delayed in terms of when we see the children achieving some of those milestones. Um, we don't see everyone, but you'll notice that several individuals also either had an official diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or at least some behavioral features that were like autism, and Dr. Sid's going to go into a lot more of this. Uh, pretty consistent were children having issues with speech delay or problems with articulation, um, and one child who had some issues in terms of focusing or attention deficit. Next slide. With this, um, I'm going to start at the beginning of life. Um, basically, the way I'm just going to sort of cut to the punchline, the children have been doing well from a medical point of view, at least um, from my perspective. There haven't been things that have been, you know, really, really terrible medical issues. 
Um, there were a few little things at first, and, and several of you I know as parents have realized um, even within the first few days of birth that something might be different. Um, some of the babies were yellow, some of them needed some oxygen to help breathing, um, some of them stayed a little time in the neonatal intensive care unit, either with problems with regulating their sugar or their temperature. Um, but these were not, you know, sort of prolonged hospitalization. There were little hiccups though on the, in the neonatal period. Next slide. Um, there were also some things that once parents were taking their children home from the hospital, they started to notice right away. And some of you brought this to the attention of your pediatricians. Um, problems in terms of muscle tone being lower, so they were kind of floppy. Uh, problems with feeding or latching on or suckling. Um, problems in terms of being a little more sleepy or a little more irritable. Um, and then two parents reported some hearing issues. Next slide. And you'll notice again through these some variability. Um, so I want to underscore, I think everyone on this call already knows this, but I'm going to underscore that we've seen some vision issues. And uh, as I think about this, I always want the children to have their senses working as well as possible so that they can get information coming into their brain in a clear, undistorted way. So we have noticed a variety of vision problems, uh, astigmatism, or rather astigmatism, strabismus, cross eyes, uh, being farsighted, some things that can either be corrected by patching, surgery, glasses, a variety of things, um, but importantly, correctable issues that can help see the world clearly. Next slide. So important in terms of getting eyes checked uh, by a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, again, Dr. Sid is going to go over this in much more detail, but in terms of the way the brain works, um, some people saw that just literally the pediatrician, when they used the tape measure, could see that the head size was measuring smaller, um, and then also noticing some issues, especially in terms of muscle tone, so being floppier again, like we said, in infancy, sometimes being clumsy or not quite so coordinated or smooth in their movements, um, and some were even diagnosed with cerebral palsy, although let me be very technical about this. I don't think it's, um, I often think of cerebral palsy as being problems in terms of getting enough oxygen at birth. So I don't think this is technically cerebral palsy, but again, just a hive P2 manifestation. Next slide, Lindsay. Um, with this, uh, one thing I'm glad uh, to see is that we haven't been seeing seizures as a frequent manifestation for hive P2. Um, again, the numbers are still small. I think people like Dr. Sid and myself still look for any evidence of this, but the good news is that we haven't seen this as a common manifestation. Next slide. Um, in addition to that, one of the more common things and, and um, one of the things that I know parents have in many cases figured out a way to deal with, um, although it can still be challenging, are gastrointestinal issues. So everything from constipation to diarrhea and sometimes even both of those in the same person, um, but problems with reflux, um, and generally these things are things that can be treated oftentimes with either simple medications or dietary changes, uh, but still something that can make the children quite uncomfortable. So it's important to be able to get under control. Next slide. Um, infections, and remember when I said Hive P2, we were wondering about whether or not there was any connection with the immune system. Um, we have seen a bit in terms of infections. I wouldn't call this an immunodeficiency. I don't think anything has been sort of extremely severe in terms of the infections, but we have seen of, um, ear infections, otitis media is what the pediatrician may call it, but ear infections sometimes requiring ear tubes, um, and I actually think that's a good thing uh, to make sure the fluid's out and make sure that the children are hearing well. Um, and then two children with urinary tract infections. Again, these things are very easy to treat, but just being aware of these um, to make sure that you know, they're treated properly with antibiotics. Next slide. Um, lung issues, I think, have been what I would consider typical pediatric lung issues. So a couple children with asthma, but nothing out of the ordinary. Next slide. Um, also, as I said, not very frequent, uh, but we did have one child with urinary reflux, or in other words, urine that was going back up from the bladder up back up to the kidneys, and important again to know that and uh, treat it if necessary with um, making sure that urinary tract infections are treated and those, those infections don't go into the kidneys. Next slide. Um, one issue that we see um, oftentimes if the children are having gastrointestinal issues can be tied to problems with um, gaining weight or growing, um, maybe they're not eating so well or having feeding issues, and so sometimes those can go together. Next slide. 
And in terms of some of the surgeries that the children have had, thankfully, uh, for the most part, they haven't been major surgeries. Um, the surgeries that have been tended to be same-day procedures, but ear tubes, eye surgery for the strabismus, having the tonsils or adenoids taken out, um, or one child that had uh, something a little bit more complicated, uh, surgery on their bottom. Next slide, that's the anoplasty. Um, Again, uh, not many bone abnormalities. I will say that we haven't really had the children going through puberty, so I think we will be watching for scoliosis or curvature of the spine in particular, uh, but we did see one child with a hip dysplasia or problem with the way the hip uh, was developing. Next slide. Um, I've listed here the medications so that you could get a sense of what medications some of the children are taking. From my point of view, um, really a third of the children didn't have any medications beyond maybe a multivitamin, so that's good. Um, and it also tells me kind of the seriousness with which someone needed to have um, medication if they need to be treated. And Dr. Sid's going to go over some of this in more detail um, in terms of thinking about treatment for some of the neurobehavioral things. Um, again, one child had epilepsy and took medication for that. A couple of children had some gastrointestinal issues with reflux or uh, constipation and took things for that. Um, two children were taking antidepressants and two children were taking issues that were in part at least for some of the hyperactivity or agitation. Um, and melatonin was taken by one child, which can be a sleep aid. Um, that can be helpful with regulating sleep. Next slide. So I'm going to summarize uh, my part of this, and then we'll open it up for any questions for this portion. Uh, again, the flavor I want to give you is that it's mostly um, a neurological manifestation, largely with developmental delay. Um, I do want to emphasize, and I think Dr. Sid is going to emphasize this as well, that although the children have language delays or problems with speaking, um, I think they understand a lot more than they're able to always express. Um, so be careful what you say, because uh, a lot of it, you know, they're just absorbing like a sponge. Um, and then from a medical point of view, I actually think they're largely doing very well. Um, I'm not saying there aren't issues here or there, but um, we haven't seen life-threatening issues. We haven't been seeing problems in terms of um, major heart disease or cancer or diabetes or things like that. Um, with the limitation, as I said, that you know our kiddos really haven't even gotten to adulthood um, or even really through puberty. So we're going to be watching very carefully to see how things evolve. Okay, I think, uh, Lindsay, that's the last of my slides. Yep, that's right. Okay, so we'll, let me pause here and I think, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, but either people can type in questions and you'll be glad to read them out, or if someone wants to unmute themselves, they can just pipe in with any questions. Yep, exactly. Dr. Chung, um, this is uh, Kimberly Burke, the mom of the twins. Mm -hmm. And I did have a question in regards to um, the uh, vision um, issues uh, we, I haven't um, been on the site. We will get on the site and get all of, you know, our daughter's information up there. But I was just curious with um, a lot of the other, you know, children that do have this um, condition, was there anything like a vision therapy recommended or is there anything that, um, because our daughters have had strabismus, they've had the eye surgeries, and we're still kind of dealing with some we think depth issues, and I just didn't know if anybody, you know, if or even if you or Dr. Sid had any recommendations, um, you know, eye wise. Mm -hmm. So I'll answer, and then I'll also let Dr. Sid answer because he may have a different perspective. Um, when I've talked to our pediatric ophthalmologist, I do think that there are, um, like you said, surgery for strabismus, uh, glasses in terms of correcting any d difficulty seeing at a distance. Um, all of those things are very important, or astigmatism, you know, all those things are important to correct, um, like I said, to be able to see the world clearly. In terms of vision therapy specifically, uh, depending on how impaired the vision is, depth perception, other things, I do think there are things that you can get coached for, either by, um, depending on the severity, sometimes I'll use Lighthouse for the blind, or I'll use, if it's less severe than that, uh, some of our therapists that are in our eye institute that will help me just in terms of thinking about color contrast or other things to mark stairs, for instance, if there's problems with depth perception, which, you know, can be a safety issue. Um, you know, other things like that that can be pr quite practical. 
Um, what the pediatric ophthalmologists tell me is that sometimes what people will call vision therapy, like ongoing vision therapy over and over for like years at a time, is not nearly as helpful. Um, there may be things to do to sort of figure out how to set up your home and set up the environment um, and sort of tricks to be able to know how to accommodate to the extent that you call that vision therapy, I think that's very helpful. Um, in terms of some of the ongoing longer than that, I think it's it's not as helpful as say speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, you know, physical therapy, things like that. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Chung, I'm not sure you can hear me. This is Joanne Pisano. Yep, I can hear perfectly. Hi, I just wanted to chime in one thing, it's a kind of a question and a comment. Danny, my son, is. we have not finished the registration, and I will also get on that um, so that we're part of all of this, but he has hit puberty, so he's 13, okay. and it's been pretty intense. It's great for not me, <laughs> but, but I will tell you that um, I wondered if you, I, I, don't, I know you're going to have to wait till you get some older, older people, older, um, obviously, but um, if, there, if you have any predictions either based on other similar, um, you know, genetic disorders about the puberty piece because you know I've always approached it from an autism spectrum piece but like for example is there an indication it's relatively early he's 13 but he started going through puberty around 11 and a half 12 and it's pretty much full-fledged which I think for a boy is a bit early um, so I'm just wondering if anything about puberty that you have learned about or you know we can be guided on at all <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'll say a couple things that I consider general things, and, and again, Dr. Sid may come in with his other his own ideas, either during his presentation or just after I speak. Um, so number one is puberty is just like when you were going through puberty, it is a time of big change. Um, yeah. And so there can be changes as well in terms of just growing, grows very quickly. So I can see if I'm going to see scoliosis, I'm more likely to see scoliosis during puberty, not necessarily that it needs surgery or anything like that, but it is something I think that's good to check for. Um, there can be an increased um, sort of frequency of seizures, so someone who didn't have seizures before, but then they can come up during puberty, so it's something that, you know, I'm just attuned for if I'm seeing some staring episodes or something that looks like some twitching that doesn't look quite right or spacing out, um, so I have a lower threshold in terms of, you know, getting an EEG or seeing the neurologist if there's something that might look like a seizure. Um, and other than that, there can be some, um, you know, just, I, I, my, and I have teenagers myself, so I, I think I'm allowed to say this, but, um, you know, teenagers, it's just its own thing, um, even for quote unquote normal teenagers. And so the hormones are changing, behaviors change, um, there can be outbursts, there can be, you know, sort of tantrums that come with that. It was like the terrible twos become the terrible twelves. Um, and yeah. so, you know, there can be those types of behavioral issues as well. well and they can be really challenging, especially as some of the kiddos are getting bigger, just physically bigger, and um, you know, can just as they're throwing throwing things or moving around can can be more hurtful, um, not intentionally so necessarily. Um, yeah. So those are the things that I look for and see. Um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't been seeing things like all of a sudden diabetes coming up or heart conditions coming up, um, but it's still early days on that. And so, like I said. Get a grain of salt, um, but those are the things I think at least it makes sense to me to be screening for. Okay, thank the you. The only additional thing I would add is sometimes headaches or migraines can also emerge in the midst of puberty, so sources of pain, especially mm -hmm. if a kid is pointing to their head or you're concerned for headaches, that's another consideration. Thank you. And I have a somebody through chat that just wanted to know um, if you'd be able to touch on the subject of regression, so losing the ability to walk or talk. So at least from who reported into Simon's VIP, um, no one had what I would have called a permanent and serious regression. Uh, and again, Dr. Sid may want to chime in with his uh, perception of this. So I don't think um, you know, in terms of what we've seen so far, I do think there's sometimes times when the kids don't necessarily uh, completely master a skill. And so it feels like they know it one day and then they forget it the next. Um, to me, that's not really true regression. It's that they haven't mastered the skill and kept it going forward. Um, the one thing I'll say in terms of the long, long-term course on this is, like I said, uh, we don't have a lot of experience in terms of kids aging up and getting, you know, into young adults and beyond. So 
Um, I think we're still waiting to see how things turn out to be completely confident, you know, that there isn't regression or, you know, what's going to be going on then. Uh, Dr. Chang, this is Narissa. Hey, Narissa. Um, so I, I may have misunderstood you, but um, you, you were talking about how um, there was only one child with concern for um, possible bone issues, um, but potentially watching for scoliosis during puberty. Is that um, is that due to growth or the way that the bones change um, mm -hmm. during puberty? Yeah, um, so let me amplify that. So I haven't seen that people have congenital abnormalities of the bone. Um, that can be a reason for scoliosis in some cases. Um, this is more a general concern I have for children who are hypotonic. Um, and then when they go through a very quick, uh, quick growth spurt during puberty, sometimes things can end up, you know, not aligning, not being quite so straight. Um, so, and sometimes, like I said, it can be scoliosis, but it's mild and something that doesn't necessarily need surgery or, you know, major bracing or anything like that. Um, and it could be that this ends up being very infrequent or not even ever the case, but that it's just a general sort of rule for me for children with neurological conditions with, where they've got hypotonia. Okay. So, um, Curran, he has recently been diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency and, oh. um, we're two months into uh, human growth hormone treatment. So um, this may be a good time to kind of monitor also if he's going to be going through um, some quick growth. Yeah, and it's very easy to do. So it doesn't require x-rays or anything like that. Just when you're in the pediatrician's office, they're just literally going to look at the back and see if things are lining up and are straight. Um, so it's very, like, literally takes five seconds to do. So no reason not to do it. Got it. Um, I have a question here uh, from a mom wanting to know if some of the children eventually are able to speak in full sentences or if speech may remain absent in the children, in the children moving forward. Um, again, I'll start and, and Dr. Sid, you know, certainly should chime in. Um, I guess from my point of view, speech is complicated, um, you know, speech coming through the mouth at least, verbal speech is complicated. The sense I get from many of you and the patients that I've seen is there's a lot of going, there's a lot of processing, there's a lot of understanding, there's uh, a lot of information that wants to get out. Whether it gets out is actually speech through the mouth or speech through a communication board or other assistive device. Um, I've seen children be successful who weren't speaking per se, but yet had a lot to say, if you will. Um, it just came out in, in other communication mechanisms. Um, so I would say, yes, it could be possible that someone would be nonverbal with Hive P2 um, in the sense of not speaking, but my guess is they do have a lot of information to get out. And, and with technology improvements, I think there are going to be more and more ways of being able to get some of that information out. I don't know, Sid, do you have a, a different perspective or different issues? No, I, no, I agree. I think, I think one kind of consideration is, is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this in my talk about um, rates of development, because I think um, as knowing where a child is currently in terms of uh, their rate of development can be helpful in terms of making predictions about where they may be, assuming they'll continue along that current trajectory. So it, the, I would just say that the, it depends, to answer your question, it, it depends on, on where your child is currently in terms of their current language functioning and uh, their rates of development and what that trajectory will be over time. So I think it depends. So it's, I think it's a complicated issue, but I think in addition to the cognitive component of language, I think there's also, as you alluded to Dr. Chung, there's also the, the motor component as well. And, and I completely agree that communication can mean forms of communication as well. And so the key thing is not just uh, or not just a verbal communication, but uh, any type of communication. Okay, maybe we should transition over because I don't want to cut Dr. Sid short on his time. Okay, 
Dr. Sid, we're ready to go wherever you are. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can hear you now. Okay, great. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the neurodevelopmental profile of, of Hive P2 disorder, and specifically the, the cognitive profile, the behavioral profile. And I know uh, the introduction, the introduction, it mentioned epilepsy, but due to time, I'm not gonna talk about epilepsy features that can certainly answer questions about that at the end. And this talk is really based on the two previously published studies on Hive P2 as well as uh, data from the Simons VIP project, which is ongoing, and also some anecdotal data from patients that I've followed. Here is an outline of my talk. I'll present some background information. I'll spend the bulk of my talk talking about the neuropsychological profile of high P2 disorder, and then I'll wrap things up with some conclusions. So first, some background. So as all of you know, high fee 2 is a genetic disorder associated with distinct facial features, intellectual disability, autism, hypotonia, delayed motor development, and behavioral features include but are not limited to things like hyperactivity, aggression, anxiety. Let me spend a couple of minutes talking about development because I think it's important for the understanding of this talk. So first off, what is development? So there are multiple ways to define this, but I like to describe it as basically a timed, ordered series of events pertaining to acquisition of different functional milestones in multiple streams. It is timed in the sense that each event is supposed to occur at a specific age and it is ordered in the sense that each event follows a particular order, one right after the other. And milestones are observable achievements useful to the child and which reflect ongoing brain development. Milestones can affect multi or occur in multiple domains, including cognition or thinking, language, adaptive or self-help skills, motor skills, and social skills. Milestones occur within a normative window um, in terms of age of achievement. So for example, with respect to motor milestones, sitting occurs by six months, standing by 11 months, walking by 12 to 14 months, and so forth. Development is quantifiable, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the concept of a developmental quotient. So for each stream of development, you can generate a developmental quotient, which is basically the child's developmental age with respect to that domain divided by their actual age. So as an example, you have a 12 month old child whose best language functioning is babbling, which is a six month old skill. Their language developmental quotient is six months divided by 12 months or 50%. So developmental quotients can apply to each and every stream of development, including cognition, language, motor, and so forth. And their developmental quotients are standardized such that the mean is 100%. So 100% is a child who is typically developing. So developmental delay refers to a significant lag in the achievement of developmental milestones with respect to a specific developmental domain. So in other words, a developmental delay means that a child's DQ or developmental quotient with respect to that domain is lower than 100%, such as 85% or 70%. So a two-year-old child who has a language developmental quotient of 65%, a cognitive developmental quotient of 90%, a motor developmental quotient of 88%, so their main feature is language delay because the language is significantly behind. So neurodevelopmental disorders are disorders that affect how individuals walk, talk, socialize, learn, and behave. And these are really descriptive terms. For example, significant motor impairment is characterized by the term cerebral palsy. Significant language impairment is characterized by the term language disorder. Language and social impairment is characterized by the term autism. Cognitive impairment is characterized by the term intellectual disability. And behavioral problems are, uh, can result in symptoms of 
ADHD, anxiety, depression, aggression, self-injurious behaviors, and so on. This is, of course, an oversimplification, but you get the idea. And in high P2 disorder, the gene defect causes developmental brain dysfunction, which results in this full spectrum of neurodevelopmental disorders. In terms of specific neurodevelopmental disorders, the term global developmental delay represents a significant delay in at least two major domains, and that usually includes cognitive and language. Um, global delay is the precursor diagnosis to intellectual disability. So around age five to six is when the label of global delay no longer applies and the term intellectual disability is more suitable. And that's because this is around the time kids can undergo formal IQ testing or neuropsychological testing, which can generate a full-scale IQ. And intellectual disability is defined as having significant impairments in thinking skills, so um, full-scale IQ less than 70 or 70 percent, um, along with impaired adaptive or self-help skills. So just to talk about language, because that's quite important, and it's the primary way we interface with the rest of the world, I think the language is having two components, an expressive component and a receptive component. Expressive language is our ability to communicate thoughts and ideas, and receptive language is our ability to understand thoughts and ideas. And then finally, autism is characterized by deficits in social communication how we're connected to other individuals on a social basis, as well as restricted repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. There's a significant overlap between neurodevelopmental disorders. For example, 40% of individuals with autism have intellectual disability. So now that we've covered the basics, let me talk about the neuropsychological profile of high p 2 Some of this data will be from one of the two or the two previously published studies on individuals with high p 2 And some of this data is preliminary data analysis collected through the Simons VAP project. And as I don't need to go over um, the project, but just to know that these are the different genes listed are included in this consortium and HIV-2 is one of them. So I looked at the Simons VIP data and I, when I last looked at this data, there are eight participants. So I know it's a little bit different from what Dr. Chung presented. I think I looked at it at a little bit of an earlier time. So there are eight participants coming from seven different families and one was a father-daughter pair, um, both were affected, um, but I'm really gonna uh, focus on the seven children. And out of the seven children, about 60% were females, um, and the mean age of the participants, or the average age of the participants was around six years of age. In terms of neurodevelopmental diagnoses, about 30% or close to 30% had a small head size or microcephaly, 14% had seizures. All of them had low tone or hypotonia, and 43% had a, a label of, of quote unquote cerebral palsy. In addition, 43% had a diagnosis of autism, uh, close to 30% had a language disorder, and close to 30% had a learning disability. In terms of the different types of high P2 variants represented by these participants, um, they're listed over here, but I'll, I'll just leave the slide up and, and, and go on to the next slide. So let's talk about the cognitive skills um, and intellectual disability as it relates to high P2. So there is a, a wide range of intellectual disability seen in high P2. And remember, intellectual disability is defined as having a full scale IQ or thinking skills lower than 70. And out of the eight affected individuals previously published, so these are the ones who are published in the, in the reports that are listed below, seven out of eight had intellectual disability, and one out of eight had borderline intellectual disability. A few of these individuals had full-scale IQs reported, 
in these two studies that I've listed below. The full-scale IQs range from 50, which represents moderate intellectual disability, to 75, which re represents borderline intellectual disability. So moderate ID or moderate intellectual disability suggests that an individual may require support to care for him or herself. And in contrast, an individual with mild intellectual disability may be able to live independently for the most part. So of course, ID or intellectual disability is, is intrinsically linked to adaptive or self-help skills. So I'm gonna talk about the adaptive profile of Hive P2 or the adaptive skills or self-help skills. Adaptive skills refer to basically practical everyday skills that are needed to function. You know, in other words, there are self-help skills like eating and dressing and toileting. Adaptive skills can be organized into different domains. Um, and just as, with, with, just as with developmental milestones, each adaptive skill has an age of achievement associated with it. And you can come up with scores that quantify how affected you are or how impaired you are with respect to adaptive skills or self-help skills. The violent adaptive behavior skills or the VABs is an instrument or a, a tool that does just that in terms of quantifying adaptive skills. So the Vineland quantifies self-help skills and generates standard scores for communication, socialization, motor skills, and activities of daily living. So this graph shows the standard scores on seven participants um, who are in the who are in the the Simons uh, VIP study. And so um, just some interpretation, um, just some background on interpretation of scores. So with scores, the average is 100, and one standard deviation below the average is 85, and two standard deviations below the average is 70. So put differently, a standard score of 70 means that person is doing 70% is 70 of where they should be for that skill. So a 10-year-old who has an adaptive score of 70 has the adaptive skills of a 10-year times 70% for a seven-year-old boy. Um, and the adaptive behavior composite uh, measures um, provides basically an overall summary of adaptive functioning. The communication domain measures how well uh, a person can exchange information with another person, um, express themselves verbally, and so forth. Daily living skills measure um, the practical everyday skills, um, and these include things like self-care, dressing, hygiene, um, and so forth. Socialization refers to self-help skills in social situations, uh, play and leisure activity. Motor skills represent self-help skills in, in gross and fine motor areas. So for the seven patient, for the seven participants, the composite score um, was 59. So this means that on average, each child was functioning at around 59% of where they should be in terms of self-help skills. And so you can do that same kind of little exercise for each of these other domains. Um, so all of these scores were lower um, in terms of communication and daily living skills and socialization and motor skills. All of these scores were lower than what would be expected for age. Um, and just one point though, communication and socialization skills were actually relatively higher while daily living skills and motor skills were relatively lower. So one of the um, questions that I received was, what are the best therapies to focus on when having um, uh, with a, a child with high P2? So this is probably a good time to answer this question. I always like to emphasize, <coughs> excuse me, language therapy, especially alternative uh, augmentative communication if there's limited spoken speech. Um, PT and OT or physical therapy and occupational therapy are helpful to address mobility goals and self-help skill um, self-help skills in those areas and then aqua therapy and hippotherapy and hippotherapy being therapy that involves horses could be helpful for strengthening axial tone so in case of hypotonia um, which sometimes may be beneficial and then there's some kind of sometimes families uh, mention that music therapy may not you know may be fun but may also 
reach kids in ways that these other traditional therapies uh, may not. Okay, so let's now switch gears a little bit and talk about the autism profile of high P2. I showed this slide earlier, but based on the Simons VIP data, about 40% or more may have a diagnosis of autism. To more precisely characterize the features of autism within high P2 disorder, I looked at a couple of different instruments or tools from the Simons uh, data. The first is a instrument um, called the Social Communication Questionnaire, or SCQ. The SCQ is widely used as a screening tool for autism. The total score from the SCQ is interpreted uh, with respect to certain cutoff values. So a score above 15 suggests that the individual may have autism and needs a more extended evaluation. So in this uh, cohort, the total score was 16.7, suggesting a strong likelihood of autism, you know, generally speaking for this, for this cohort. And the number of individuals with a total score greater than 15 was four, so about 67%. Another tool that I looked at which uh, dives deeper into the autism profile is the social responsiveness scale. So this instrument focuses on a child's reciprocal social interactions, um, how they socialize with one another, uh, which is a core feature of autism. So these are the scores from the uh, SRS. So let me walk you through this. So there's a total score, um, and there are also five subscales, awareness, cognition, communication, motivation, and mannerisms. Social awareness is, for example, you know, is a child aware of what others are thinking or feeling? Social cognition is about um, recognizing, for example, recognizing if others are trying to uh, take advantage of that person or trying uh, getting that kind of feedback. Social communication is, uh, you know, example of a question pertaining to social communication is, you know, avoiding on eye contact or having unusual eye contact. An example of a question for social motivation is, would the child rather be alone or with other people? And then example from the mannerisms uh, subskill is, you know, do they have a pretty narrow range of interest, pretty restricted range of interest? So the SRS generates T-scores, um, and let me kind of tell you what that means. So a T-score in this sample of 76 or above is considered severe and strongly associated with the diagnosis of autism. So the total T-score in this group um, suggests that overall there is social impairment that may be severe in degree. Um, and then when you're looking at the five subscales, the most affected was the autism mannerism subscale. Once again, that pertains to things like having a pretty narrow range of interest. And the least effective was the social motivation scale. For, and once again, that pertains to questions like, would the child rather be alone than with others? So now that we talked a little bit about the autism profile, I want to also make sure we talk about other behaviors that may be problematic. So I looked at an instrument that's called the Child Behavior Checklist. So the Child Behavior Checklist, or CBCL, is a parent report checklist that talks about frequent emotional and other behavioral problems. So the CBCL has two broadband scales and eight syndrome scales. So the, these broad wide scales are the internalizing domain scale and the externalizing domain scale. So the externalizing domain scale measures behavioral problems um, things like aggressive behavior, things like rule breaking. Um, the internalizing domain measures kind of emotional problems, things like anxiety, depression, feeling withdrawn, those kind of things. In this group, granted, there are only three uh, individuals who had complete data for this instrument. So externalizing problems were elevated uh, in contrast to internalizing problems. So once again, externalizing problems pertains to things like aggressive behavior, rule breaking. 
So this instrument also has these individual subscales like uh, pertaining to anxiety, depression, um, complaints about how they're feeling, social problems, and so forth. And the key points about this is that there were three syndrome scales that were borderline elevated, and those were social problems, thought problems, aggressive behavior. And then there's one syndrome scale that was especially elevated, and that was the attention problem scale. So attention problems were uh, particularly an issue, um, just the caveat being that this was only three participants. So this is a good time for this question. Any ideas or information on impulse control or behavioral difficulties? Any meds or supplements that can help? So when I think of these kind of symptoms, I think about ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So this is a disorder associated with inattention, distractibility, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and symptoms have to occur in multiple settings. In terms of treatment, there are two approaches and often both are necessary. So there's a non-medication approach which involves behavioral therapy whose purpose really is to get the parents, give the parents strategies to redirect a child's behavior. And if behavioral therapy is not really effective, medications may be necessary. And there are three main classes of ADHD medications, methylphenidate products, which are stimulants, uh, dextroamphetamine products, which are also stimulants, and non-stimulant medications. Treatment often requires a trial and error approach, starting with one class of medication and switching to another because of poor response and or side effects. I recommend a start low and go slow approach, especially because the metabolism of kids with high P disorder may be different. The main side effects of ADHD meds are decreased appetite and disrupted sleep, but both of these have solutions and you don't necessarily have to give up on a medication because of them. Adderall can lead to increased aggression in some, and this was noted by one of the high P2 families last year. And I really recommend waiting at least one week before deciding whether a med or dose change is effective or not, and really trying to avoid the temptation to stop a medication early unless there are really severe side effects. So choosing which medication depends on your preference for duration of the, how long you want the medication to last, uh, how your child can take medications. Um, within each class of medication, there are short acting forms, long acting forms. There are pill options, which you can't crush or chew. There are capsule options, which you can open up and sprinkle onto food, chewable pills, liquid solutions, even patches that you can apply onto the skin. And among uh, the medication options, there's not any one clear cut winner, although one family last year reported that Vyvanse was uh, especially effective for symptoms of ADHD. So I've also received this question, what behavioral medication works best with families, uh, with people diagnosed with high P2? How many meds have been tr uh, trialed with families with older children? So this is a vast topic, and I, I really encourage you to watch the talk I gave last year on medical management, um, but please feel free to contact me because it's a very complex and vast subject, and I'm happy to kind of talk to you further about, about this. So let me just wrap things up with some conclusions. So one, there's a wide range of intellectual disability associated with high P2 disorder. Um, two, Self-help skills or adaptive skills are impaired in children with high P2 disorder, and motor skills seem to be relatively weaker compared to other self-help skills like communication and, and socialization. Autism, number three, autism is a common feature in high P2 disorder, um, though social motivation actually is a relative strength. So it's, it's not that all aspects of a socialization are impaired, but some aspects of of the autism profile are more effective compared to others. And then four, behavior problems such as ADHD or aggression or impulsivity do occur in high P2 um, disorder, and, but there are treatment options, but the, it's, it's a complex subject and there's not one solution for every individual who is affected. 
the last thing I just want to kind of do another quick plug for the fact that I, I, I have started this high P2 clinic here at Boston Children's with goals of really optimizing neurodevelopmental outcomes and helping coordinate care about uh, across different disciplines. And with the idea being, you know, being able to address the neurological issues, the developmental issues, the educational issues, and concerns about, uh, you know, questions about treatment, um, and with some opportunities to participate in things like biobanking. So uh, with that said, um, uh, thank you. And any questions? Hi, doctor. So this is Julie Conlon. Um, my daughter, Charlie's two. We're looking to book an appointment with you probably sometime in Q1 this next year. I was wondering if you could just share briefly a little bit on the biobanking. Sure, sure. So at here, here at Boston Children's, there's a, a it's kind of a, a hospital-wide or through the Department of Neurology-wide initiative through uh, what we call the Translational Neuroscience Center, where any child with a neurological or neurologically based disorder can uh, uh, elect to have s saliva or blood or other biological specimens stored, or frozen down, um, with the possibility that a researcher in the future can access these samples and, and study these samples all in an anonymized uh, fashion. So it's, it's not specific to high p 2 but it piggybacks off of an existing effort to um, to collect uh, samples from uh, children who have uh, neurological-based conditions um, with the possibility of studying those um, in the future. And let me also say, this is Wendy Chung, that for um, those of you who want to be able to have your samples used by multiple researchers, we do have an option with Simon's VIP to have your blood drawn in your local town um, to go through one of the laboratories that we have a contract with. And then that can be banked, and any researcher can for free be able to get those samples from Simon CIP. And we're, um, we have an effort right now to be able to find investigators who will also use IPS cells. Uh, and if they're investigators that want to study Hive P2 participants and their IPS cells, um, we're trying to underwrite the cost of generating some of those that are going to be helpful to the research community. And that has the advantage. And, and certainly this doesn't preclude anything that Dr. Sid said, um, but this just makes it a little easier in the sense of you can give once and then a bunch of different investigators can use the same sample. Um, and all of that, again, free of charge. And for anyone who's interested, um, they can contact Lindsay afterwards and she'll steer them in the right direction. Thanks, Wendy. Um, and Dr. Sid, I have a question from a participant that's asking about um, if you had any, it's, it's seizure related, which I know you didn't cover, but they were asking if you had any reports of absence seizures. So I have been. Um, uh, a quick thing, I think um, there have been reports of complex partial seizures. Um, uh, complex partial seizures uh, used to be referred to as petite mal seizures, and actually currently in the current nomenclature, another name for them is focal onset seizure with uh, impaired awareness. Um, sometimes they can look like absence seizures in the sense that sometimes these focal seizures with um, uh, with impaired awareness can look like staring spells, and absence seizures can also look like staring spells. But um, absence, the, the the term absence seizures has a, um, is associated with a specific EEG pattern, and I, I think sometimes there can be a mislabeling of absence seizures as uh, these complex partial seizures or focal impaired awareness seizures. Um, so if if the question is, uh, you know, are there staring spells? Um, that kind of look like epsilon seizures that have been reported in high P2, the answer is, is yes. Dr. Sid, this is uh, Kim, the twins mom. And um, in regards to seizures, I have a question. Um, We've seen a couple, um, a lot of staring spells with our, our daughters, and I can't, and I apologize, I can't remember if we spoke about this recently, but um, uh, in order to, I guess, diagnose um, a child with having 
a seizure, do you recommend doing the 24 to 48 hour seizure studies through whatever hospital it might be, we're closest to Yale, but is, is that the way uh, to actually diagnose um, a seizure? Or if you put a child through that for 48 hours, may you not even get um, you know, the data that you need to do that? Right. The, the key thing about is the key thing about this is to capture a spell on the EEG. So if a spell is happening infrequently once a week or so, you can do a recording for 24 to 40 hours, which may provide some information, but it may not capture the spell and uh, it may not be helpful in terms of answering is the spell a seizure or not. But if the spell is happening once a day, then doing a 24 hour EEG in theory would be able to capture a spell and kind of help answer is it a seizure or not. So it, it depends on the frequency. Um, Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, this is Narissa. So, um, one of the um, a commonality that we found, and this is really through um, discussions in the Facebook group is that um, almost all of the children seem to have an abnormal pain threshold or pain response. And um, combined with delays in language, um, I wanted to see if, if um, either um, Dr. Sid or Dr. Chung, if you guys have any recommendations on um, how to make sure that our um, our kids are safe, um, that we're not ignoring a response that's not there. If there's any best practices. Sure, uh, I can start to answer the question and Dr. Chung, I, I welcome your thoughts as well. Um, it's just some general comments about the decreased pain threshold. And this is something we see in, in kids with autism and other genetic forms of autism and, and intellectual disability. And unfortunately, I don't think we have a great understanding of why that is the case. Is, is there an issue with the, the stimuli, the, the pain, um, the thing that's causing the, the pain? Is there an issue with uh, the, the nerves sensing that stimulus? Um, or is there an issue with the brain processing that signal? Um, or an issue with some, uh, you know, the circuitry in between? And I, I think we don't have a great understanding of that. But in terms of how to keep, you know, keep our children safe, I think one thing just to remember is um, in terms of if there's, uh, you know, if there's a self injury that involves hitting your head, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the skull is pretty protective of, of the brain. And so you'd have to exert a large you know, amount of injury, a large force, large acceleration to actually incur injury to the brain. So the skull is pretty protective so not to worry necessarily about a bad aspect but just general you know general sense things in terms of um, uh, you know safety around the house uh, making sure stoves and gas you know stoves are not accessible those kind of practical uh, general things um, I think it's I think it's challenging I, I think it's it's quite challenging but I think you know trusting your gut in terms of uh, safety proofing the house and those general kind of things would be good. And this is Wendy. I'll just add one more thing. As we were talking about, some of the children also are motorically clumsy. Um, that is that they can stumble or fall or not, not be so coordinated. Um, and so, it, like you were saying, Narissa, they may not always complain or cry or be upset. Um, so I just have a slightly lower threshold in terms of getting x-rays, you know, if there's been a significant uh, problem or and or in terms of just looking, um, if it looks like a significant tumble or something else, um, just to be able to, you know, look and see for any swelling, uh, redness, tenderness, you know, anything like that. But it does sometimes require a little more um, being proactive either on your part or your pediatrician's part, or like I said, if an x-ray should be necessary. Um, but, you know. Hi, this is Meena um, Yom Gupta's mom. We met uh, Dr. Sid last year in December, and it was a great meeting. So Dr. Sid, I had a question about uh, one of your th um, therapies list that you have. 
um we are investing a lot of time in aba and i don't see that part of your list i'm just wondering if that has helped the other parents or um is there any studies where is it um shown to be uh beneficial or yeah right right that's that's a great point i i i overlooked it but i i agree aba therapy is uh is helpful and um it sometimes can be difficult challenging to get aba so just for background so aba being applied behavioral analysis therapy it's a form of one on one therapy and in this uh in it, it's it can be difficult to get aba therapy unless there's a diagnosis of autism um and aba therapy has been shown to be uh beneficial for kids with autism um so i i think um what the reason i think it's it's beneficial is that you can tailor the goals of aba therapy to whatever you think is best so you can tailor the goals of aba therapy for self help skills or for communication skills slash language skills or even for addressing some uh, you know uh, motor goals and and other things like that um it's uh at the same time i also um just to bring this uh idea out as well is that uh some families uh uh will spend a lot of time and effort in terms of all you know multiple types of therapies pt ot speech and language aba and so forth and it's also good to kind of sometimes take a step back and uh for each therapist that you're seeing making sure the goals of the therapist are in line with your goals and making sure that if there is not progress that's occurring then kind of readdressing and and saying well why are we not making progress towards the goals um so just to kind of summarize yeah i agree i think aba therapies is um can be quite helpful and uh, though it can be difficult to get aba therapy unless you have a diagnosis of autism so that's number 1 and number 2 i i think this applies to aba therapy but any kind of therapist it's always good to kind of list your know, top 2 or top 3 goals that you want for that therapist and make sh- and if you're not reaching those goals then talk to your therapist about well why are we not re- reaching those goals and or should we adjust readjust our expectations or should or should we try something else um yeah thank you um this is Lindsay i have a question that came through chat um one participant is asking about cannabis this is for that it can help with speech delays or autism um do the speakers have any thoughts on cannabis and high p2 sure so there's there's a lot of interest about uh uh cbd um cannabinoid oils um recently there's in the epilepsy community the epilepsy world um there's been some data about the use of cbd for certain types of uh epilepsy such as Dravet syndrome which is uh, which is not high p2 um i think there is a lot of interest about the use of cbd in areas apart from epilepsy in this in the cerebral palsy community um in the autism community at this point i i think there's not uh enough or people are looking into studying this more um in these kind of areas of autism and cerebral palsy and so forth but i i don't think there's uh data um to support its use yet um but there's a lot of active interest in this area so i i don't think uh i can make a recommendation one way or another um as with respect to high p2 but just that it is certainly an area of uh, a lot of interest this is narissa again um i have a a question and it's uh probably more general about development um dr sid as you were kind of going through and explaining how um how the scales work um i'm curious in these um neurodevelopmental conditions where you have a child who um at 10 years old maybe presenting uh more at a level of a 5 year old right. is there a trend where you see that um 
typical development kind of stops um, when you get to be a teenager. Um, does that rate, do you expect that rate to continue? Meaning um, when, a, when a child that's affected by a neurodevelopmental condition is 20 years old, um, do you typically see a, a rate continuing to improve or is there a point where it stops? Right. Or right. is it not? Right. Yeah, right. Usually by around, by around uh, 16, you know, uh, mid to late adolescence, 16 to 18, around that time period. Um, so that, meaning that if your rate, if the rate of development is 50%, when you're 20, it doesn't mean that you'll be t at the 10-year level. And when you're 30, it doesn't mean that you'll will be at the 15-year level. Um, so kind of the, the, the threshold is, or the, uh, it's around 16 or so is when you kind of um, consider that the upper bound. Okay. Uh, late adolescence. Any other lingering questions? Oh, yeah, hi. Hi, this is Meenal uh, again. Uh, this is Vyom's mom. So I had a question about gene therapy. If uh, you or Dr. Chung can talk to it. Uh, so uh, well, let me hand this over to Dr. Chung. So I'm glad to talk a little bit about gene therapy. It's a very complicated um, topic because gene therapy involves what some people call gene editing as well as gene replacement or gene addition. Um, some of you may have seen things, you know, for instance, about the recent Chinese scientists who started doing gene uh, editing on embryos. And so um, I'm not talking about that when I'm talking about this, but people have talked about doing it for um, treatments uh, in terms of neurological conditions and other things. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity for certain conditions, and some of you may have heard um, there's a neurological condition that Dr. Sid and I both take care of, a condition called spinal muscular atrophy, and um, the FDA has just received an application for gene therapy for that condition, and there are vectors, something called adeno-associated virus, that has been very effective for that condition, and that virus um, is able to specifically target the brain and target neurons, which is something that has been, had been difficult for us to do before. So I do consider that a major breakthrough. Um, it has proven to be relatively safe. Um, one of the things we don't know, or there are many things we don't know about Hive P2, but there are several things we don't know about, um, for instance, how much we need to get in there. Um, it was a subtle point that I went over quickly, but it looks like for most individuals, they're essentially missing one copy of Hive P2 or it's not working properly. So in theory, one could think about getting that back in the neurons or the cells. Uh, what we don't know is if you give too much, um, if you go overboard, if that would be problematic. Um, so that's one thing we'll have to deal with. We will have to think about the issue of um, whether or not there's a developmental time point that's critical in terms of getting the high P2 in. Um, and I talked just briefly about this at the beginning. It's in part, we think, related to the brain's development, but it's also uh, likely related to the brain's ongoing function. And so there are some experiments that can be done in mice to try and address this, to have a, a mouse model of these issues and to test some of these things out. So one of the reasons why Dr. Sid and I both mentioned the biorepository or cell lines or IPS cells, uh, because I do think to address some of these issues about therapeutics, whether it's gene therapy or other things, scientists are going to need a variety of um, ways of testing this out in things short of your children. So steps first in terms of thinking about cell lines to test this out in, eventually mouse models, perhaps other animal models, but there's a lot that needs to be done to understand what therapies might work and then to demonstrate which ones are going to be safe and perhaps effective. Um, so I guess the bottom line is I do think it's an exciting possibility. It's not a foregone conclusion that it's going to work, but it's a very exciting possibility. Um, but there's yet a lot of work to be done to demonstrate both that it's going to be safe and effective and then durable, or in other words, that the therapy will continue being effective over long periods of time. So definitely stay tuned. Um, I don't think high P2 is going to be the next 
uh, sort of FDA approved gene therapy. I think there are going to be many things that come before it. But on the other hand, what's exciting to me is that other diseases uh, are proving safety, efficacy, durability, and we can build upon lessons that they've learned, especially from the vectors that can be used to deliver the genes. So stay tuned, just the bottom line. Thanks, Wendy. I have another couple of questions that came in through chat. The first, and this may be something for the families or NARSA, um, but if somebody wanted to donate money to help research high P2, um, is there a best option for places to donate? And I say this is for the families because um, I know Simon's Foundation funds Simon's EAP, so. Yeah, um, so right now we we don't really have um, an official way to do that through the families because we don't have uh, a nonprofit set up yet. Um, I know I have been talking to Dr. Sid about the possibility of um, planning for the future for um, maybe an in-place family conference. Um, something like that, but um, but we, as far as I know, there, there's not anywhere where we can currently donate money to yet. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, yeah, maybe that's something you guys can talk about at the end of the call. Um, well, thank you, Narissa. And um, the second question that came in through chat um, is. A person is wondering if most of the children in this presentation attend public schools or um, are they in specialized schools? And um, just oh. looking for a, about um, schooling in general from Finland. So let me, uh, I can start um, answering, help, I can help answer that question. Uh, a lot of the families, a lot of the kids um, attend public schools, um, um, but with an IEP and um, receive special education, um, whether that's uh, contain that's within a regular classroom, so for special education integrated in a in a regular classroom, um, or in a substantially separate classroom, and that can be a combination of the two. In fact, there are some individuals who have. Uh, who receive all of their who receive special education primarily in the regular classroom um, there are some individuals who receive who are completely in a substantially separate classroom and then there are some um, some kids who have you know maybe half of the time or some percentage of the time in one setting and some percentage of the time in the other in the other setting um, what i say is for <coughs> excuse me for for children um, under the age of three every state or most states have an early intervention type program that would be able to provide developmental services. And uh, many states, um, uh, when you turn three, have a process where you can be evaluated um, through the public school system to see if you qualify for special education services or for special education preschool. Um, that may vary from state to state. Um, uh, so I, uh, I, and some there are some individuals who are in out of district placements, um, um, but that's only if um, the the state will pay for an out of district placement if um, it can be demonstrated that the public school has failed to serve the needs of the child, um, and that can be sometimes a hard bar to or hard uh, hard to demonstrate that. So the vast majority of kids are in public schools, um, um, public school. Uh, settings um, receiving um, varying combinations of special education and receiving direct services such as PT, OT, lang uh, um, uh, speech and language therapy. Thank you. And I had a, another question that also came in through chat, and maybe um, Dr. Sid, you can weigh in on this. This participant wants to know if there's any sort of significance to a physical tick. Uh, for example, their child has a tick where he unwillingly raises his shoulder repeatedly. Um, is there any neurological significance? Um, and is there any significance in any studies to that? Sure. Uh, there's not any, with, 
with a tick like that, there's not any uh, risk for harm or risk for neurological harm uh, pertaining to the tick. So, um, and often we don't necessarily treat ticks unless there's uh, uh, some sort of impairment to the uh, child or some sort of uh, uh, physical, um, uh, whether it's causing, unless there's um, functional impact on the child or um, it's affecting learning in the school and so forth. So uh, ticks, um, in the majority of cases, are harmless and, and can be monitored. I, I haven't uh, heard much about ticks in, in other families, um, but I think we're learning more and more about the movement disorder spectrum in, in Hive P2, so that may emerge as one of the things that um, um, may be uh, increasingly recognized in the future. Thanks so much. Um, and I know we got done a little early today, um, but just to give the presenters a break, we've had a really great question and answer period. Um, if anybody has one last question, um, go ahead and chime in. Otherwise, we'll wrap up the meeting. Actually, um, I have actually, one. sorry, I have one last question. Um, in looking at um, Dr. Sid's um, domain, it was pretty interesting to me to see that the motor um, domain was actually the lowest out of all the other um, areas. And I know in speaking with families, uh, typically as children start to get older, their um, physical therapy services get um, reduced or cut altogether. And uh, more of a focus ends up on um, the daily living skills and um, the behavioral therapy and things like that. Um, besides physical therapy and occupational therapy, are there any other recommendations um, for um, improving that motor deficit or um, treatments, medications, anything like that? Yes, it's. I think. Um, I think the first. It, you. It's a good point about the motor skills. I think, um, as, as we get more and more longitudinal data, meaning data from not just one time point but multiple time points, it would be interesting to see the trajectory of motor skills over time, um, whether they kind of continue at the current rate or if they start to flag behind the other domains. So I, I think just. Just to start with, I think it's it's very important area to study. In terms of specific therapies, besides physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, there's unfortunately there's not uh, there's not there's not other kind of spe specific therapies for kind of motor skills. Um, it, some people have tried things like. Um, you know, if there's a fatigue component, some people, um, uh, not specific to high P2, but uh, in, in generally speaking for neurological conditions, some people may do things like carnitine or, or other kind of supplements, but unless there's, uh, that's more kind of just trying different things to see if something may be helpful. Um, physite, I think having physiatry, a, a physical medication and rehabilitation uh, specialist involved in the care um, is an important aspect. Um, over time, low tone sometimes can develop into spasticity or high tone. Um, there can be consequences on the hips and spine and so forth. I think uh, thinking about uh, incorporating a physiatrist or, or rehabilitation medicine uh, doctor may be important to kind of, uh, as another person whose uh, goal is to really optimize uh, functioning, particularly with respect to motor skills. So there may not be a specific mo uh, motor, uh, a specific therapy targeting those motor skills, but I, I am suggesting kind of thinking about somebody like a physiatrist or a PMNR, physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, um, thinking about bringing someone like that as part of the medical team uh, to monitor um, tone, um, help with tone management, and uh, if there's need for bracing or other equipment um, uh, that may be helpful just kind of keeping an eye on things um, so yeah 
and, and I welcome Dr. Uh, uh, Chung's thoughts as well. No, I think Dr. Sid had a good summary of everything. All right, well, um, on that note, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up for the folks that sent um, some last minute class questions via chat. Well, um, I'll make sure to follow up with all of you all individually, um, but thank you so much to our presenters, Dr. Sid and Dr. Chung. Um, greatly appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who participated in Simon's VIP. Obviously, your data was heavily used tonight, so we really appreciate your participation.